Thank you, everyone. I hope the caffeine has kicked in, because <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about one of the buzzwords of this year. Um, I got interested in it seven months ago, and this is when I started. Um, You can hear me? OK. No? On this slide, please. OK. Can you hear me? Can you hear anything? No. I can use a mic if you want. OK. Okay, so uh, seven months ago, um, I started you know, to investigate blockchain at the Media Lab. Um, I've been working on mobile health applications for the last three years. Before that, uh, electronic medical records and e-health was my uh, area of uh, interest. But now I'm applying blockchain mainly in healthcare and in health solutions. So um, Today, let's uh, buckle up and try to unlock the power of blockchain in healthcare. And I'll, today, I'll talk about three things. One is some fundamentals. Uh, I don't expect everyone in this room to know everything about blockchain. And I sometimes when I explain it, I hear people saying, oh, OK. So I hope that I can get some fundamentals out here uh, for my understanding of blockchain in that specific context and uh, to help you um, follow up with the next two points, which is where blockchain is going beyond cryptocurrency and financial services. So this is something I'm not interested in. This is why I want to take you further and see the future of blockchain in, info, in health informatics, uh, which is mostly going to be something that you, you don't hear much about, uh, but it's going to be something in the future. Uh, the last point is to tell you more about the things that I've been working on at the Media Lab. Um, in the healthcare digital sector using blockchain, in modernizing the delivery of healthcare and preserving privacy. So it works on information security, privacy, and uh, uh, the modernization movement that's happening globally. Okay, so let's start with some fundamentals. I go to a doctor when I don't feel well. I go there, I go see him because I want him to make me feel better. Okay, normally, he either t uh, you know, um, run some tests, take um, um, uh, an image or a scan, uh, or maybe write a report after operation, but some information is being flowing and generated out of those visits that I do to feel well. Now normally, the doctor cannot um, control the information unless he uses an information system to process and generate and record those information uh, using systems. Those systems are uh, owned and managed by a healthcare provider. So this is me setting the scene of how um, the information is being collected, processed in regular traditional care. Um, I am a patient myself, and I've, uh, everyone here had a record in one hospital from day one after they got, you know, after they were born. So we're all familiar uh, with the um, with the concept of. Um, um, of having an, an, an electronic medical record. Now, electronic medical records are, you, uh, are run, managed by healthcare providers. I can go to another country and have other records and tests done, and that is also managed and controlled by a healthcare provider in another con continent. I was born in the States, raised in Saudi, um, I lived in the UK and now I'm back to the US. So I've got records everywhere. I have a, thi a thyroid condition, I've got skin contact allergy, uh, I'm uh, asthmatic, so I've got to maintain lots of medication and I cannot pronounce the name of my medication or condition. <laughs> but I need to work on getting those information out. So that's the traditional way. What blockchain is doing in that context is to get rid of the uh, controlling aspect or man in the middle, we call it, between the patient and the doctor. So there is no control in between, it gives direct communication between the doctor and the, uh, and the patient instead of having to do it through a healthcare provider in terms of owning and managing information. Because whenever I move from, uh, uh, relocate from one country to another, um, I ask for my record and most of the time they don't give it to me and I am the patient. So what is blockchain? 
in that context, we're talking about having a distributed ledger technology. It is a distributed ledger technology that holds transactions uh, data and tracks it. So it holds a little bit, but the main reason for, for holding it is to track the transaction of assets, okay? In our context, it's the electronic medical record data. It's the patient medical information. Um, so for me, it's a bookkeeper. It's not a database. It's not the whole electronic medical record. For me, it's the use of knowing where the patient electronic data is being uh, generated, recorded, because now it's very important to work with existing systems. But in the future, I hope that blockchain will get rid of the, um, being connected to um, legacy system being controlled by that. But at the moment, you need to work with what is existing. So, so as systems are there, they're not connected. You need to use a blockchain to connect them using like a bookkeeper of where exactly the patient has gone and what information has been uh, collected and diagnosis has been uh, done on the patient. It is a shared, shared uh, decentralized network of nodes. This is where the patient and the healthcare professionals come in. So I don't have one doctor, I have multiple doctors, a care team for one condition and another care team for a second condition. Some people have chronic diseases and so on. So you have multiple care teams taking care of you uh, for each specific disease or condition that you have. And a lot of people, older people, they have, it's very common to be comorbid when you suffer from multiple conditions or diseases and simultaneously following multiple treatment pathways. So it's very important that the care teams, they talk to each other. So it's a shared decentralized, when I say decentralized, meaning no single authority in the middle controlling it. It's at the doctor's side, my, uh, as a patient, my side. And I get the same exact copy that the doctor has, the bookkeeper, what exactly has been done on me. It enables a peer-to-peer -peer communication, meaning it's not a network that, you know, centralized. It's from one point to another. It's one-to-one, peer-to-peer. So there is no man in the middle uh, controlling it. Uh, without the need for an intermediary, which is the healthcare provider in our context in healthcare. Finally, it allows for a new generation of transactional applications between the parties, and the parties here are the patient and his care team members across the world, in the continents, in the different healthcare providers that are, uh, care for them. Some people never left home. Uh, they have one healthcare provider that can manage to give them everything. They're lucky not to be sick very often. So uh, in my case, it's been very difficult to maintain my record, and this is just a simple, I'm sure there are more complicated cases. So how does it look like? For me, it's a thread and a block of uh, block units. Those block units have specific I uh, identical um, structure, and I'll show it to you in the next slide. So for a block, it tracks a transaction, da uh, transaction data uh, to follow uh, or to track an asset. In our case, it's the electronic or the medical information. So each block describes the transition of medical data. It has the header, and the header here has an ID that identifies this block. So this is, for example, in um, um, a specific blockchain, uh, a blockchain with a specific ID that can, um, where it's easy to locate uh, the chain or starting point of the chain or any point of the chain, but this is how you identify the chain you're trying to look for information in. And also it can have, uh, it has also the previous address. So it tells you which, this, uh, the previous address of the block unit that is before this unit that we're talking about because it is very important to know the sequence in blockchain. So each block has the previous address. If it's the last one, then the last one. If it's, there's a next one, then you will get to see. There is another block unit that links to, to the, 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 uh, the block that uh, we're talking about. So there is a sequence. Uh, the one that doesn't link to, uh, there, no, no block unit referring to it, that means it's the last block in the blockchain. And also, depending on the, um, consensus protocol, and it's the way that they pr verify any new blockchain, uh, sorry, block unit. Um, so sometimes there's a proof of work, and there are different protocols for how the parties agree on which unit to, or um, which unit to get in and which not to add to the blockchain. And this is the call it consensus, that everyone has to agree to any blockchain, uh, any block unit that is added to the blockchain. And also the timestamp. 
So timestamp and the ID are very important in the sequence. Why the timestamp? Because um, it tells which block was generated before the other one. And any change in a previous one will affect the, um, the ones that uh, were added later on. That's why the blockchain is, um, let's say, it can be trusted because we will know if there is any change in any content in each unit because all of the remaining ones will be actually invalid. This is in the block header. And in the block content, you will find the details that you store. So here, it will be details of the medical information. Uh, in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, it will be the details of who sold which crypto, um, um, uh, which coins, uh, who sell coins to whom and how much. So this is the detail. They track the coin um, uh, and the, and the uh, cryptocurrency in, in, in Bitcoin example. But over here, we're using it beyond cryptocurrency. So we're tracking here medical information. So here you have the details, the data, the, the, the let's say the core, the most important aspect or element in uh, the blockchain, which is the data. And then finally, the um, blockchain signature, uh, the block signature, which tells who generated the block. Using, uh, um, crypto, um, using public and private keys. So normally, if I generate a new block, I would sign it with my digital signature. That says that Shada has generated this block unit. She owns it, okay? And this is how we get to know who generated each block unit so we know who's there and who uh, is actually, so if we need that information or the details, we know who to go to. And this is for validity and um, um, trust. So you get to know to trust who's actually adding the, there is, um, uh, no anonymity, an anonymity in here. Um, so the benefits, the general benefits that I picked from, so there are lots of um, different benefits, but from, my, from the context where I'm coming from, uh, these are the three main benefits that I see um, blockchain is adding value to uh, electronic medical records and uh, healthcare. It is because it digitally tracks asset transactions between a group of parties. That's the most important, digitally. Um, second is that it provides a tamper proof. No one can tamper with it because anyone changing any of the data content of the transaction will affect and you will see immediately that the rest is invalid. Anything that hasn't been changed will, not be, it will still be valid. So you will be able to um, trust the data that is in the blockchain. And uh, it, um, it so it gives you a tamper proof trail, timestamps of block sequence. That sequence helps with the timestamps so you know exactly the story happening there. And finally, it establishes transparency because of those benefits and features there and trust between parties. It creates a trustless system, meaning we don't need to trust each other. We will, need, we will trust the technology. So as foreigners, are, uh, as people who don't know each other, we don't need to trust each other to, to use this. Today, people don't share information because they don't trust how they're going to use it whether they're gonna protect it the, at the same level that the uh, data owner would, uh, would love to. That's why this is very good because uh, the data owner will know um, how the information is being used and uh, who is accessing and it, is, it can track back to him. So it maintains um, ownership. There are different types, but these are the three main types that I picked for you uh, and have um, been uh, well, um, discussed in the literature. So there, there is the permissionless and two types of permissioned uh, blockchain, public and private. So let's take the first one. Um, the first one here, anyone can join. There are no restrictions. Anyone can buy Bitcoin as long as they have money, okay? Um, anyone can also view the ledger and contribute, meaning I can get to download uh, the whole ledger and I can see who sold and who bought and who has how much of the Bitcoin. This is, and uh, the Bitcoin is one example of uh, a permissionless blockchain. No one, is, um, no one authorizes the contributions, meaning if I, uh, if I bought or sold a Bitcoin or I joined and contributed, no one can say no to me. Okay, so no, can, no one can stop me because there is no authority there saying who should and who shouldn't be um, trading in, in Bitcoin or in that cryptocurrency. And finally, no one has the authority to validate the transaction, so anyone can. No one tells who should validate or mine using the consensus protocols, but anyone can mine the blockchain in this type of blockchain, okay? So it's very, very flexible. Anyone can join, anyone can contribute, anyone can validate. 
What about the public permissioned one? Um, there is an authority that manages the blockchain. And I'll come back to this point. So since there is an authority, for example, it could be a government controlling or managing that blockchain, but it's still available for anyone to view. Not to change, not to add any block, but just view. And finally, there is, there is an authority to validate the transaction. So there is someone who is specifically um, authorized to um, validate or let's, let's say um, mine the uh, blockchain. This is normally the same authority that is actually managing it. And I'll give you an example here. It could be um, um, this, well, it could be a government providing healthcare services to their citizens. So they would like to add a block for each healthcare service they provide to their citizens. They don't want anyone, uh, sorry, that, that's publicly, sorry, that's uh, a private one. I'll come back to it. A public one we could be a fish market. Uh, there is a very good example use of that in tracking fish. So f from the minute they take it from the fisher until they uh, uh, give it to the restaurant for cooking uh, and prepare it for recipes. So it will track the, um, the originality of the uh, fish and where the fish has been gone. So this could be generated by a company uh, or could be the government, but everyone can see uh, the, um, the change or the asset, which is the fish here, um, changes uh, throughout the time until they get to see and eat the fish. So this is one good example. Anyone can see it, but not anyone can add a block unit because they have nothing to do with the content of the blockchain. The final, uh, the, the final type is private. It's very similar to this one, but not anyone can view it. And this is when I say the government giving services to their citizens. So they don't want someone from another country contributing or, uh, or, or viewing their citizen services. So this is very restricted. So there is still a managed authority, but no one can view the ledger. It's very, very private. It's a very specific group of people that decided beforehand. And there is an authority to validate the transaction. So these are the main three types that people are working on in the literature today. There are others, but these are the common ones. Okay, so I have moved from the fundamentals and now I'm gonna to explain to you um, how I see where I've seen blockchain use mostly. So today I'm gonna to talk about healthcare, but there are four or well, three other sectors, um, uh, in, uh, industries that blockchain has been heavily used. And uh, we did that by searching the literature. And I'm not talking about uh, startups, I'm talking about the literature here, okay? Uh, who provided a good model or framework that is fully studied uh, to contribute to, uh, that uses blockchain in one of the industries. And we found them in governments, for e-government services, supply chain, and supply chain could be for governments, could be for in healthcare, could be um, in other, but just generally supply chain. Uh, the fish example was in fish supply chain. Uh, and uh, healthcare was one of the key ones. And finally, the Internet of Things application. So those are the four key sectors that we found blockchain heavily used today. So anyone would like to join and work on areas, I think those would be good starting points. And those are the four sectors that we found. And, we, and today I'm gonna talk about healthcare. Where I come from is I always had the passion for helping healthcare systems because you know I've been a patient myself, so I just stand at being someone involved heavily in it, and I'm uh, and I love doctors, so that's another reason. So let's talk before I go ahead and talk about how we use blockchain in healthcare today. I'll talk about the modernization movement. What's happening today in healthcare globally? So being a patient, an international patient, I call myself. I'll give you two examples of how I see modern healthcare modernization movements happening. One would be um, sorry, one would be in Saudi Arabia and the other one would be in the UK. But why the modernization movement is happening, it's part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and it comes third after uh, poverty and hunger. So it's one of the very essential goals for, the, um, for sustainable development. And uh, this is their vision for tw 2030. So we're trying to contribute to that goal and they mentioned here that the aim is good health and well-being by having access to quality essential healthcare services. And I'll talk about this for the rest. Um, I'll talk from this point um, for the rest of my presentation or the remainder of my presentation. 
So let's talk about the efforts done globally, and these are real cases, and I've been involved in both of them. So let's start with the UK. I've done my PhD in the United Kingdom and my master's, and um, my PhD uh, case study was in cancer uh, treatment, breast cancer treatment, and uh, I worked with, uh, directly with the Valentia Cancer Center people, with the security officers, and uh, also with the clinicians and nurses in order to understand the problems they're facing in sharing information and modernizing healthcare according to the UK's specific plan that meets the United Nations bigger agenda. If we look at the population permit in the UK, we'll see the majority. The majority of people are between uh, 25 and 54 years. And if we look at the below or uh, above, we will see that the above population or the rest of the population are actually more in quantity than the lesser. So in my definition, I consider this an aging population. So 70.57% uh, 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 of the United Kingdom's uh, population, starting from 25 and all the above, uh, are old population. Um, comorbidity, so the, the, uh, and this is based, based on the UK's findings, government findings. Comorbidity is more common in older people, so the target there is to have holistic care, meaning considering all of the conditions and the treatments the patient has been uh, going through in order to make a shared decision, to make to help the system be more proactive. So they try to um, prevent uh, symptoms you know, from developing or to help doctor, uh, the patients manage their conditions without having uh, a drug interacting with another drug on two different parallel uh, treatment uh, pathways. So having holistic care is very important in aging population because of the comorbidity that is common in such population. Saudi Arabia on the other end of the spectrum. When we look at the population, the majority still between 25 and 54, we see that the younger are more in population than the older. 3.4% above 65% of the population. I find that strange, but these are statistics. So 91% of the population is actually young. In this context, you cannot just bring a solution for comorbidity when the generation is really, really young. So what you need to do here is something very different. You need to keep them out of the hospital. So the aim here is to make them responsible, give them an active role in their treatment, and uh, make them um, uh, the driver of their choices and outcomes, um, uh, health outcomes. Uh, this is to, um, to keep them mostly out of the hospital. That's the aim that is uh, the government there, the Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia is aiming for, to keep the patients out of hospital. That's why they generated health, uh, health systems, three different health systems prior to being patients, which starts with the awareness and being an active person in social, uh, mental, and also um, social, mental, and physical well-being. By giving them the awareness at home, at school, also the second service layer that they give is to, give, is to provide a healthy community Meaning if I go to school, I find healthy food. If I go to, in public places, I still find healthy food and gyms are available for me whenever I need them. So, and you know, the, the atmosphere, the, uh, the community is very supportive of me being more active, eating healthy, being healthy and living healthy. So this is the aim of the, um, of the Saudi um, agenda for healthcare. And the third last one before being patients, prior patient phase, is by giving them the electronic at, uh, infrastructure that can help them identify the symptom or just read about the symptoms before deciding to call just a doctor or just go ahead and go. So, yeah, this is playing tricks on me. <laughs> Sorry about that, okay. Um, so th these are the three services that the Saudis are providing for their citizens. So they don't become, I didn't touch it, I swear. <laughs> just back a little bit, yeah. Okay, yes. <coughs> okay, so these are the three services that the government are providing to, for patients in order for them not to, um, uh, not to become Google doctors and just you know, finding every symptom on, on Google and uh, fearing uh, that they are actually having, suffering from um, conditions. And, and so they guide them and let them talk to their doctors, get to see their records before even calling a doctor.
Yes, please. It's not, it's not clicking. It's coming in a minute. Because you need a technology to suit your goals. And there are two different goals, contradicting goals. And you need to make it uh, supporting those specific goals. So in, in, in older population, I would say holistic care that considers comorbidity is the key goal in healthcare. And for the um, for younger generation population, it's better to keep them out of hospital by providing them by providing Okay. So we'll move to the products. So at the Media Lab, we contribute to the two different models using two different products. Each of them uses blockchain in a very different way. Starting with the younger generation, sorry, uh, the uh, older comorbid one. Here, we're, moderni we're trying to modernize healthcare in the first project. Modernizing healthcare using a project we call Healthy Blockchain. And we try to preserve privacy in modern healthcare using Opal for Health um, um, project. The first one is Healthy Blockchain and it's in contribution with, um, in collaboration with Valandra Castle Center and uh, Cardiff University uh, at the Media Lab and King Saud University. One more, please. Yeah. So here I'm going to describe to you the breast cancer that I worked on with the doctors. Normally the patients, the patient, um, see alarming symptoms and, and then he goes to, uh, to the GP or general practitioner or family doctor in order to see um, whether they have um, cancer or not because that's, the, um, that's their suspicions. If the GP is suspicious, then he or she would refer the patient. It doesn't click. Can we... He would collect data, examine the patient, and then uh, uh, and refer the patient to secondary care. So that's primary care, and then he's going to refer them to uh, the pa refer the patient to secondary care. In secondary care, there are triple assessments, three assessments uh, that uh, that are done, uh, starting by a surgeon or a specialist who does further examination in the specialty of breast cancer to check if there are. Uh, can you please move? Yeah, more. It's an animation. Okay, so that's the specialist uh, who is a surgeon. And the surgeon would take a referral through fax from the GP with some notes talking about what they've seen. They will do further examination, check the history if they have a record. Yep, and then uh, we'll refer them to a radiologist for an ultrasound and then a pathologist for a biopsy. Those three different uh, tests will be discussed in a multidisciplinary um, uh, care team review where they decide a treatment plan together sitting in that room. And I've been to those rooms. In that room, you can see the surgeon radiologist getting the PAC system on one screen. The uh, pathologists would actually get the, um, the records printed on a table. And then you have uh, the portal from So here I'm showing the different systems, the bubbles here, are showing the different systems involved in what they call a happy pathway, which is very, very simple. There are multiple complex, more complex, that has uh, loops and iterations in them for a treatment of a single patient. And the different colors here shows that the different information system, so the bubble is an information system, the color indicates the hospital or healthcare provider owning or managing that data. And these are different, uh, six different hospitals uh, or systems involved. 90% um, of the cases they undergo surgery and then they discuss it again in another room, bringing. So that normally they shout one name and everyone having any piece of information about that specific patient. Some of them bring cards uh, and uh, records physically printed and they discuss the patient's case and make a treatment decision, uh, put a, a treatment plan or decide a treatment plan. Now the idea here is to bring those systems together because normally the patient goes to the system, now they bring, want to bring the system to the patient. And this is what they call patient-centered care. The idea is to share care. Can I use this? 
Okay, so the idea here is to have shared care where care has been integrated, meaning that all care team um, members come together and they, um, and they bring their pieces for a full, to paint a full picture. They work as a team, so the mindset has to change. They have to work as a team and share uh, informed decisions. So they have to make uh, decisions that have you know, been based on information, but they share those decisions together. And finally, Okay, and just finally, I'm sorry, without the uh, visual aids, it's going to be very difficult to demonstrate. I can't use this anymore? Okay, so um, this is the aim of shared care and the definition of patient-centered care is to actually uh, have a collaborative effort between the doctors, patients, and their families at home in order for the, to achieve the, op the optimum goal of heal and uh, well-being. That's the goal or that's the definition of uh, um, patient-centered care. And there are multiple models. We can see today, oh, well, previously we had telemedicine. And now we have, we've heard about e uh, or electronic healthcare or e-health. We also heard about, um, we also heard about the, um, the idea of um, uh, the m-health and u-health. And these are all different types of models. Modern ones, emerging ones, and old ones. But the idea here is to actually provide, seam give seamless access to information so they can make those informed decisions together. And what we're doing with blockchain here, we're connecting those systems legacy or de 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 um, uh, um, autonomous systems together in order to provide the right information to the right person at the right time. This is to, give, um, uh, the, um, to provide the right information and to give a seamless access to information while the patient is moving and flowing between the different uh, treatment points. So this, this is the aim, is to have a seamless access. So this is part of the treatment of cancer. Thank you. Uh, treatment pathway, and this is exactly, you know, you can see the different systems involved in each treatment point there. And thus, this is just a very, um, doesn't like me. Can we please switch to the next slide? Okay, so here is my proposal, and now we came to the blockchain side of the story. To make sense of it, I have to tell you how the information is being flowing and how we care about the flowing, because a heart burn that is being in the history would tell if it's actually a, um, a heart attack. So knowing the history is as important as knowing the symptom. That's why previous information is very important to be there. This se seamless information has to be, uh, it, it's an enabler for holistic care. So in our blockchain here, I'll talk about the data block or uh, component in there. And I propose um, four sections. Can we please uh, switch? Okay, yes, if we can stop there. So here we're proposing um, a granular, fine-grained blockchain that can store different descriptions of the information being collected. So we don't store the whole record. At each treatment point, we have the doctor or the patient. Someone has to record some description of what happened at that treatment point. Okay, and it stores not only what happened at that point, also where that information coming from, who recorded it, and which treatment point and plan the patient follow, uh, is following, and which hospital and which information system. So it's very fine grained telling you exactly where it's coming from in order to be able to track it. So this would help you see the comorbidity. This will show you which treatment pathways the patient is actually following. Can we move to the next slide, please? So how does it work? Um, next, please. Okay, so how it works. There's a treatment point. Once the treatment point is actually over, uh, a block unit will be generated transparently to everyone in the treatment point because it uses legacy systems. And the doctor will be digitally signing it using his system. 
um, and it will be added uh, sent to the remaining care team responsible for treating that patient and this will be added to the blockchain after being validated with the rest of them. So a block unit digitally signed by the doctor, sent to the rest of the team, the team will validate it, and then they will add it to the blockchain for that specific patient. So we have one blockchain for each patient. Technically, you can have multiple. You can have one blockchain that stores information about multiple patients, but the idea here is to be able to track one patient's information using the ID, his ID. And here we bring it together that you can paint the full picture by having doctors seeing what happened to the patient whenever he goes and see them. It can be on a mobile device, it could be uh, on their system, uh, web-based access, it could be in any way. But the idea is that you track what's happening to the patient so you'll know and understand uh, the treatments and uh, the conditions that they have. And here we can have uh, using you know, smart contracts, um, a unified neutral blockchain uh, information policy that can help govern the information across the systems for patient-centered uh, information. Can we move to the next slide, please? So that's the idea. If you look at specific patient ID, you will see which points and a description of it. Very simple description. If you need that information, then you can go and you know who to talk to. Okay, the second project that we're, um, we, where we used blockchain. So here we designed a, a specific blockchain frame, framework based on the existing systems. Here we're using it for auditing and optimizing of system. So optimization of the uh, system. And is, this is collaboration with the Minister of Health in Saudi Arabia. Can we go to the next slide, please? So at uh, Media Lab, uh, MIT, uh, with Professor Sandy Pentland, um, we're developing OOPL, which stands for Open Algorithms. And the idea here is that we need to uh, build privacy-preserving solutions. Now, there is a need for people to share information to make decisions, but they don't share it today because of the privacy reason and too many restrictions. So what we're trying to do here at Develop at the Media Lab is that we allow for more sharing by not sharing the data, but rather sharing only safe answers. So the idea here, no please, the previous one. So idea here, regardless of the details, anyone who is interested in the data owned by many people, other people, can ask questions. And those questions can be vetted by the owners, and they receive an answer, a safe answer that the owner is happy with the answer, but doesn't reveal too much. So there are six main principles for the computation side of the, um, the system of Opal, um, to keep the data encrypted at all time at the owner's home you know, system, so it doesn't move around and be able to give the owners the ability to actually vet the algorithms or the questions. So they have to check the questions beforehand. Once they check it, it's there always available and digitally signed by the data owner. So I allow this question to be asked on my data. Anyone who I authorize or publicly can make it publicly available can ask that question. And that question is on their data. The idea is to run or execute the algorithms or generate the results or the safe answers on distributed repositories and provide safe answers. Can we move to the next slide, please? Where does the blockchain come in? Here, the idea is to track the question, the answer, and the description, depending on the data. But the main I think, thing, idea, um, idea is to uh, track who asked the question, what was the question, and what was the answer that was uh, answered. Seeing the answer would help people understand exactly the changes that happen. And I'll give you an example of a question and answer. The idea here, is to, uh, is to build privacy-preserving system for Saudi Arabian's Ministry of Health to uh, uh, decision makers, mainly to optimize urgent care system in Riyadh City using that system. So the idea here is for the decision makers at the ministry to ask questions stored in uh, trauma and stroke centers in Saudi Arabia. We have 50 ones. And those questions will help receive answers that can help them make better decisions of where to invest, where to build the next center, and what's missing there. So if we look at Saudi Arabia, please next slide, okay, again. This is Riyadh City, uh, next slide please. So in Riyadh City, uh, in Riyadh City we have 50, there's something missing here, we have 50 uh, stroke and uh, trauma centers. Those are managed by, uh, they're being clustered by the Ministry of Health, so each cluster would be managed by a pathfinder which is a tertiary care. Uh, in, in, our, in, in the country, uh, there are medical cities. So medical city, one medical city would manage the cluster. So we need those people uh, who report directly to the Ministry of Health to go ahead and, um, and make the decisions. Yeah, next slide please. So the idea here is to allow them to use a screen 
ask a question that will go ahead and fetch answers from those directly, from the different centers directly, and come back and uh, work out you know, the data, the results to be blinded, and doesn't reveal lots of, um, it doesn't reveal the patient's information, it doesn't reveal, in this case, the hospital's name for transparency. So um, some questions would be, have consequences, uh, and sometimes the centers will not be very, very transparent about the, result, the results. So here we, we're enforcing or trying to allow for transparency by giving them a chance to be very honest without having to, pin, uh, you know, to point fingers on who's uh, done uh, well or who didn't do well. So I'll show you here four examples for four questions and the answers that can be received in that very specific um, scenario or use case of OPAL. How do patients arrive to the center? That's a very simple question. You can ask it on the 50 centers. Next, please. It doesn't show the result. So the, the, uh, it's a histogram that can show the different uh, car and ambulance showing where the patients. And here we, we, we've seen that 84% of the cases came by car. So people go to the emergency care or someone drives them to emergency care after having a stroke using their private car. They don't use the ambulance. They avoid the ambulance. That's a very, very important statistics because it helps them optimize you know, emergency medical services that is outside the hospital's uh, main control. The other one is how do patients arrive to the uh, hospitals? And we have a, um, a, ro um, a shape file that has shown the city and exact location of each center color coded. The next slide, I'll show you the question. We can see the, class, uh, we can see the different uh, patients going from one hospital, uh, from the, the, the symptom, the location of their symptom to the right center, and the answer is actually showing exactly the route that they took. Why is this important? Because a lot of patients took the furthest hospital for treatment or chose the furthest hospital for treatment and they used their cars. So it's not using um, any formalized way uh, like ambulances where they make specific decisions. Next, please. Next. So this here show a plot where for each day of the week, the time or the amount of people who wait actually, uh, the total time it takes each patient to go from this time they saw the symptom until um, uh, they received the treatment or went to the center. And we can see Saudi Arabia weekend is actually Saturday, um, uh, Saturday and uh, Friday and Saturday. So uh, when you get to look at the statistics and the numbers there, you will find that um, the weekend, um, first day of the week is actually the worst. So um, yeah, so, so here, here is one of the, um, yeah, that's the joy plot that can show you for each. So you can see here that Sunday, at the very end of the day, it's one of the worst. The question is why? Why does it take them that long on the first day of the week? That's a very important question because it helps optimize systems, okay? So they can have mobile, portable services um, that is available on that specific day in specific regions. Uh, so the idea here is that normally today, they self-report to the minister or the decision maker there in order to make decisions about the optimization, but it's not very transparent. And it, you know, it opens the door for, um, for um, inaccurate data to be recorded and uh, reported. But using OPAL, it will help through the blockchain system and the algorithms and the physical application to be blinded and receive blind answers that doesn't actually pinpoint to the uh, you know, um, it's not about who is not manage managing this, the, the center as well, um, you know, as is expected, but about having real data and statistics that can help save lives. Another slide, please. So the takeaway message, two slides to end this, uh, and I'm very sorry about the glitch, I would call it. Um, so next, please. Yeah. Two things, um, there is a global shift towards, and it's happening across the globe in, in too many countries. And the, those developing countries are fortunate to have systems that are very mature and, um, and old, that they can replace it gradually. But uh, in developed countries, it's much difficult because data and records for people you know, for 70 years is very difficult to move the data and migrate from one system to another. But anyways, um, in, in um, there is a shift towards a modern uh, healthcare system uh, globally, and it, uh, the aim in older population is to treat them holistically by being more proactive, and in uh, younger population would say to preserve privacy in modern healthcare. That's to be pre-patient, that's the pre-patient phase to keep people out of the hospital. The last slide, please. 
And here we contribute to this using blockchain. The first uh, case is in modernizing the delivery of uh, and refurbishing legacy systems are all that cannot connect with each other and autonomous ones using healthy blockchain. And I'm very happy to talk to you about each one of those projects uh, offline uh, for the time limit that we have. And finally here, to preserve privacy in modern healthcare using Opal for Health. So here is to optimize and make good decisions, informed decisions based on blinded data answers that doesn't that help people share but at the, end, at the end of the day, they don't reveal too much or you know, breach any privacy for the data, for the patient data. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, please, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is very exciting. So I'm a healthcare administrator and an oncologist. So um, the two concerns I have, it was hard to see your circles, but when you look at the content piece, so accuracy of content, even in electronic health records, is not that great. You know, Medicare put out a statistic that if you look at estrogen receptor status in EHRs, 40% of the time what's stated is wrong. And that's just ER status. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand what you mean by content. Under Sorry, it's what, breaking. Yeah, what you mean by content. So if it's, I had a test on this date, that's fine. But if we get into the test result was this, I'm a little concerned about that, number one. And number two, the other big problem we have is as we look at these uh, new digital tools to sit on top of EHRs so that we can amass big data and make precision analytic decisions at the point of care, it's getting that content into the systems. It's, we don't know who's gonna do it, who's gonna pay for it. So what is envisioned, who is actually going to be responsible to keep the blockchain current and know that it's accurate? Concerned about the, how the information has been recorded in the blockchain in sequence of time, right? No, I'm, just, I'm worried about the accuracy of the content, not how it's recorded. The accuracy of the content, if you're dependent on the patient to do it, many patients, unfortunately, are not that accurate. Yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. So, particularly elderly patients. So, Yes, okay. So if I give the doctor to do that, and just let's hold this thought. I know they're busy, they don't have the time to record in two different systems, but the thing is, if we allow them to record that, would that accuracy problem or concern be washed away? Or nurses, maybe? Not necessarily. So who's the best person to record the information? At the moment, we're thinking the doctor is the best person because he's the knowledgeable one, he knows the codes, he knows the thing, but it, the more structured you make the, the entry, data entry, the better to unify it. So at the moment, we want the doctor to record it, but we're still finding ways, we're trying to find ways to incentivize, you know, give incentives to the doctor to actually do that because it's a waste of time for them, but the payoff is really great at the end of the day. The other thing is that um, when we look at the literature or what people have done so far, there are two different approaches for using blockchain in electronic medical records. One is to provide a new solution, propose a very new solution that has nothing to do with existing systems. This is to build something new and you need to tell people how good it is to help them adapt it. The other solutions is that they connect them with legacy systems, existing systems, to help use the existing systems within, you know, to, um, to incorporate blockchain within existing system using the exact, um, uh, uh, using the data that's been recorded. So you don't let them change their practice or the use of systems, but still doing it transparently by adding this element or boost to the recording. Uh, the best way to do it when you have large systems, old systems that cannot be replaced, is to use the first one when you add it to the legacy systems. Now, who's going to manage it? That's still a healthcare provider's information system. I talked to many doctors. They said, if you let the patient manage it, that's the best way to move forward. But I don't think that older people can do that. Uh, digital immigrants, it's very difficult. Digital natives, maybe. Not only maybe, actually there is evidence that it might be possible. If we look at the GDPR regulations, we see that this is more giving people more control. And we've seen the movement starting from 2011 where people wanted, wanted to be involved and in controlling their own data and how information is being used. So I think for the younger generation, having them manage the blockchain would be something possible in the near future. But older people, I think it's very, very difficult. My grandmother died three years ago and she can't read and write. 
it's very difficult for her to manage. She can't even use you know, the cell phone to call, but how come a, a blockchain? So it's going to be very difficult, but shifting towards that, I think we need to consider having full control for the patient for their information. Thank you. Um, just last question, please. Thank you. Um, so let me just confirm, because uh, the two examples you gave, UK and Saudi Arabia, seem to be uh, centralized healthcare. Is that right? In the UK, I know it is. In, the, in Saudi Arabia, is that the case as well? Only to being, um, sorry, being from provider to regulation. So my question is, uh, have you done any studies on... from the actual blockchains? Um. Okay, when we look at the systems in the UK and in Saudi Arabia, um, Saudi Arabia has more of a healthcare provider that has different systems for different diseases that you can go and information is being shared among them. But in the UK, you have each, these points show decentralized information access, but it's still it's one umbrella of centralized authority. But the systems technically are decentralized. That's why the blockchain helps there in the, with the integration. Um, I'm trying to find ways beyond cryptocurrency and the use of tokens and in, you know, as a way of, to incentivize. We've seen a lot of examples uh, in, in that use, but I would like to take it away from that. So there is the digital currency initiative in, in MIT, and they use cryptocurrency as the main um, you know, theme around the projects that they use. I am not using any tokens or coins because I would like to look at the science behind the use of blockchain rather than the, you know, the, the, the financial gain uh, at the end of it. I want to see beyond the financial gain to see the real use of the technology and how it can modernize the systems. But having incentives in terms of coin definitely can get anyone on board, mainly. That's what I learned from going to cryptocurrency uh, uh, conferences. But uh, doing it beyond that, you, you see very little people doing that. But it's one way to get people on board. You know, I can't get the doctors to enter data for those busy ones without having that, um, you know, that incentive. But how can we do it beyond that is very difficult. But I don't use any tokens in my research because I want to see the pure science behind it. Thank you.